Monsters are awesome. From xenomorphs to giant volcano pterodactyls, from dementors to whatever this cute little puffball is, from some nasty critter to some untamed majesty, our media is filled with monsters. I don't think anything gets me going like seeing a good kraken or leviathan or monstrous creature of the deep, even though those thalassophobia TikToks scare the frickin' daylight out of me. But monsters are at their best when they are more than just the manifestations of our nightmarish imaginations. When monsters mean something, not just to the world and its characters, but to us, the viewer, the reader, the gamer. And video games, more than books and film, have the unique ability to make monsters more than just symbols, and to immerse us in the ideas that they represent. One of my favorite stories from the world of The Witcher is the first, titled simply The Witcher. This short story is found in part in the opening cinematic for The Witcher 1, which I still always end up re-watching every so often, decades later. It tells everything about the world, about Geralt, about what you can expect to experience. The short story is about Geralt hired by a king to battle a Striga. Lift its curse if he can, slay it if he can't. It's the best example of how the world of The Witcher uses monsters to carry its theme in stories. You might think this is just another tale about a kick-ass monster hunter and some gnarly awesome creature, but it's actually about a lot more. The monster is creature of curse, but we never know who cast the spell. Was it a lover scorned, uttering in anguish, a protective parent wishing vengeance, or horrified by the acts of her children? The questions are left hanging, but as Geralt says to the Lord Ostrid, it doesn't matter anymore. All that is left is to fight the beast. The Striga as a monster is loaded with meaning. It's a warning about incest among nobility. It's a cautionary tale of kings putting personal relationships above the realm. It's about the envy and jealousy of love. It's about the horrors of childbirth in a world of patriarchs. It's about children being victims of trauma of their parents. It's about ending suffering, not rationalizing it. The Witcher world is so captivating because of how it uses monsters to tell the story of Geralt and the Northern Kingdoms. Throughout the games and Sapkowski's works, monsters are a fantastical excuse that allow the reader, the gamer, to engage with deeply philosophical and political ideas. Because as Guillermo del Toro says, uh, I assign them a, a specific function and I try to take them to the extreme with that. You know, I make them victims or I make them sympathetic or I make them brutal parasites and they become a metaphor for something else. Obviously, monsters are living, breathing metaphors that for me, half of the fun is explaining them so socially, biologically, mythologically, and so on. From Pan's Labyrinth to Pacific Rim to The Shape of Water and Hellboy 2, Del Toro is a director who knows the power of monsters all too well. CD Projekt Red knows all of this too, and the adventures of Geralt are about making interesting moral and ethical choices, and monsters becoming a foil for the decisions of other people, and a tool to convey choice to the player. From the botchling of No Man's Land of The Witcher 3, to the wraiths of the Nilfgaard prison in Witcher 2, to the Striga in Witcher 1. In the world of Geralt, monsters are metaphors for the sins of men and women. But in Greedfall, monsters are not monstrous. They do not haunt kingly palaces eating the livers of poor soldiers. Rather, they defend the land and its native inhabitants from seaborne invaders. They are guardians of an indigenous people. The metaphors aren't unobvious. These creatures are brought about because of the call of empire, exploitation, colonialism, and religious zealotry. The first great beast De Sardé fights is not a triumph, setting the tone for the rest of the game. Looking here, the monster called Guardian is animalistic, primal, made of things from a forest, not a twisted, cursed person. But like the world of the Witcher, monsters here are not the cruelest things in the world. The fight with the Guardian sets up the shameful conquest of Tyr Fridi, this land filled with monsters. Greedfall is at its narrative strongest when it deals with the mixture of colonizer and colonized, showing the violence that erupts when these two worlds meet. The Guardian de Sardé fights, the monster you fight, is later mirrored by the horrible execution of a prisoner and another of these creatures. Undeniably, we, the gamer, are meant to make linkages from the death of the monster to the death of this indigenous man. 
Monsters are demons to some, guardians to others. Metaphors of the horrors of religious brutality, metaphors for the need for violence to defend one's land from colonizers. In Greedfall, monsters are metaphors for the horrors of empire. In Road Warden, monsters are metaphors for the unknowable and untamed power of nature. This is the prompt on the title screen in one of my recent play sessions, and it was the final part that intrigued me. The wilderness prevails as indifferent as time. The peninsula is filled with crimson corpse eaters, coyote sized griffins, packs of roaming apes, fort smashing trolls. It's filled with undead, for our human shells do not lay buried in the ground. There's plague, bug infested streams that make paths unnavigable, brooding mysteries in fen and woodland glade that deter you out of the fear of the unknown. But in spite of all of it, there are folk who invite you to their fire, town leaders who want to do right by their people, wary hunters who will have your back. Like a witcher, like De Sarde, the road warden is an intermediary between these worlds. But where the witcher is an outsider among monsters and among men, and your character in Greedfall is in between two different cultures, the road warden is a mediator between the natural world and civilization. In Road Warden, you're an emissary of the southern city of Havlavin, tasked by a merchant's guild to find alliances and partnerships among the towns and hamlets of the peninsula. But the peninsula is indifferent to you, and indifferent to your southern patrons. It's not going to hold your hand to find solutions to the challenges you faced. Its monsters are unknowable, unreasonable. You deal with them like you would stumbling across a black bear on a forest hike, or a pack of wolves, or an unexpected stream. Seldom is your job to kill all the monsters, just like in the best quests of Geralt. There's always something a bit more. You often have to find ways of avoiding them, challenging them, going around them, scaring them off, or deterring them by some other means. Your axe and crossbow are more tools than weapons. The first time I read about where elks was unexpected, and then later about golems, and then later on about necromancers, and then later on about giant cats and birds, druids and beholders and goblins. Monsters were at every turn. They are as part of the landscape as trees and rivers. When done right, monsters in video games become more than metaphors. Rather, they can reinforce game design, creating that symbiosis we all look for between gameplay and world building, our controller, and the narrative happening on a screen. The monsters can help make games be better games. We've talked how in the world of The Witcher, it's all about these philosophical and political meditations, and monsters are metaphors to launch into these. The games are no different, but what makes it extra special is that Geralt's role is further heightened by the aspect of interactivity. In the books, Geralt has to make choices in the quests of monster hunting. In the games, those are choices we get to make. The dilemmas monsters pose create game problems for us to solve by investigation, reasoning, talking to NPCs, and more. Monsters become more than symbols for us to interpret, but things to interact with. We become a part of the metaphor of the monster. This is not unlike in Road Warden. I played through this game for the first time in about three hours. I realized I wasn't doing something right when I accepted Tullius' prompt to go back south. It wasn't day 40 yet, my quest log was unfinished. But still I went back. The game concluded. The Merchant's Guild stripped me of my horse Undeo and banished me into the wild where I would surely die an early death. I realized I was playing Road Warden wrong. My second playthrough was different. I realized I wasn't going to be accommodated. I came prepared with my little field notes. Stepping off into my second playthrough was like making sure I was wearing weather appropriate attire and packing bug spray. The unmovable, unknowable nature of the monsters is emblematic of how Road Warden feels and plays as a video game. You cannot know the were elks. The griffins aren't going to tell you how to defeat them. It's like navigating the wilderness or going on a hike before the smartphone. You have to find your own way. Both of these games use monsters as metaphors for the world, but also are great devices and representations of the games themselves. But not every game can wield monsters so well. In Greedfall, monsters are guardians and protectors, metaphors of colonialism, and the best we get in Greedfall is a few choices for how colonialism is handled. But monsters are ultimately fought just like bandits or radicals or any other sort of foe in the game. Monsters don't add anything to the gameness or the systems of Greedfall. Because ultimately, Greedfall doesn't say anything that interesting about colonialism. 
nor do colonial themes feed into its gameplay or systems. And while I applaud and enjoy Greedfall for trying to do something different in the world of RPGs, something we so desperately need, its inability to weave the metaphor of its monsters into the actual game itself is why it falls flat when you compare it to its peers The Witcher and Road Warden. It shows us what happens when you don't give enough credence to the monstrous. Whether it's Godzilla representing the atomic bomb or alien princes representing refugees, monsters are ways of making sense of the world, and video games are filled to the brim with them. Monsters can be philosophical and political battlegrounds, giving us ways to meaningfully engage with ideas that would otherwise be too impenetrable, too serious, or too unimaginative. And through games like The Witcher, Greedfall, Road Warden, and many, many more that aren't on this list but are out there, we are able to have experiences that explore these metaphors and conversations in a way that can help us understand the world around us. So while the popularity of monsters will ebb and flow in other forms of media, I will be forever thankful that monsters always have a home in the world of video games, and we will constantly breathe new life into them. And the next Striga, Nidag, and Were Elk will take on a whole new meaning to a whole new group of gamers. Thanks everyone for watching. Please let me know what are some of your favorite monsters in video games or elsewhere in the comments below. And double points if you can point out their metaphors and symbolism. I do try to get to each and every comment, so drop a line. This video was largely inspired by Road Warden. I can't recommend it enough. It's a difficult game to show via video, so I did very much try my best. Its characters and monsters and stories are some of the best I've experienced lately in the world of RPGs. Hope you're all doing well, and I'll see you next time. Yeah.